Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network here at the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you so much for being with us here today, October 9th, 2019, for our RN and Allied Health Oncology Lecture, uh, working with LEP patients and medical interpreters. And just a few things before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions at all about the uh, technical problems that you may be experiencing, uh, the audio is fuzzy, you're not seeing something you think you should be seeing, you should be seeing both me and the slides, uh, anything of that nature, call us 919-445-1000 or email us at unccn at unc.edu. We have folks standing by to help you. Uh, we want this to be the best experience possible, so let us know right away if you think there's a technical problem. Our website is unccn.org. We have plenty of information about past lectures, over 200 of them, future lectures, uh, live lectures, our, our, uh, uh, our portal where we have lectures that you can take for credit, and of course this lecture is for credit. Uh, lots of information, so please visit us there. Uh, we hope that you will use Poll Everywhere. Our presenter today will be asking a number of questions, and uh, it makes it more interesting and more engaging if you can go ahead and answer uh, those questions to the best of your ability. These are all anonymous, so uh, go ahead and, and do take just a minute to get yourself set up. Two ways you can join us for Poll Everywhere. I think the easiest way is just to go to pollev.com, P-O-L-L-E-V dot C-O-M forward slash U-N-C-C-N, and as soon as you go there on any uh, laptop, uh, desktop computer, smartphone, uh, tablet, you'll, you'll get right to the place where you can go ahead and see the questions as they appear, answer them, and then at the end of the presentation, you'll have an opportunity to ask your own questions. So please be jotting those down throughout the presentation and then share those at the end. Uh, alternately, if you would like, you can use your uh, texting capability on any mobile phone. In the To field, type in 22333, and in the Message field, type in U. UNCCN. You'll go ahead and send that. You'll get a little message back saying that you've joined, and then you'll be able to share the letters that correspond to the correct answers, and then at the end, share your questions. All right. Uh, the, the, the actual question and poll everywhere will show up in a minute, but just to let you know what it is, a trained interpreter should be used to improve communication, resulting in fewer errors, clinical outcomes, and satisfaction with care in patients with limited English proficiency. Uh, I think this is kind of a softball. Uh, a is true, B is false, and so you can let us know what you think in just a minute. All right, and without further ado, uh, I want to introduce uh, Miriam Pierboom. Miriam, welcome. Thank you. Thank really you for glad to me. have you. Really glad to have you here today. Let's see uh, what I, I know about you from your notes, uh, from the notes I have. Uh, Master's in Business Administration. And where, and where did you get that? Through Pfeiffer University. Oh, great, great. And uh, Master's in Healthcare Administration. Also through Pfeiffer. Also through yes. Pfeiffer, great. And a CMI, Certified Medical Interpreter, and a Certified Healthcare Interpreter. Yes, those are the two national certifications available for medical interpreters. Great, and you're going to be telling us more about those during the presentation as well. Terrific. Uh, education Specialist at UNC's Hospitals Interpreter Service where you've worked in different roles since the inception 20 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, presently, main responsibilities include recruitment, orientation, training of interpreters, creation of written and verbal testing tools, bilingual and interpretation skills assessments of hospital staff and interpreter candidates, and education on the importance of interpreters and how to properly work with interpreters. Correct. Great. Yes. So uh, I think you're the right person to, to give this presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds like you are very well qualified. Well, what's one thing that, that we should know about you that wasn't on your, your CV there? Um, I don't know if you should know about it, All but right. if you want to know, uh, sure. I was born in Holland in Amsterdam oh, originally, great. and my last name actually stands for pear tree in Dutch. Okay. So. Okay. Well, that is great. Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing that with us. Thank you. So let's take a look at that poll. So here it is. It's gone live now. A trained interpreter should be used to improve communication, resulting in fewer errors, clinical outcomes, and satisfaction with care in patients with limited English proficiency. So, um, all right, we're already, as we, we've already got a trend going with answer A, <laughs> true. Um, how are they doing? Very good. I'm glad to see this. Good, <laughs> good, good, good. So, yes, this, uh, this is all um, right on target. 
Um, so work. So I'll let you go ahead and introduce the title. Okay, it's uh, working with LEP or LEAP patients and medical interpreters. All right, and so you have, you pronounce LEP LEAP and the, all right. E either or. Either, either or. or. Okay, yeah. great, mm -hmm. great. All right, and we're going to jump right to a video. Can anyone interpret for me? Yeah, that is a pretty powerful video, I believe, and I uh, wanted to start the presentation with that because um, I feel that a lot of the information that I'm going to be presenting will maybe make a lot of sense or you'll be able to take it in a little bit better um, if you go to the perspective of the patient, right? If, if you put yourself in their shoes, what would you want in that situation? What, what would make you feel most comfortable? So. Um, some of the objectives that we'll be covering, we'll be talking about interpreter versus translator. What is the basic purpose of the interpreter? Uh, review some of the interpreter roles and modes, uh, ways in which we can interpret. Things that you as a provider um, or the person working with the interpreter should know about the interpreter. Uh, some of the best practices when working with an interpreter or a translator the importance of using a qualified interpreter or translator and uh, review some of the legal implication, implications for not using a qualified interpreter, um, talk a little bit about bilingual and interpreter skills assessments, and then um, ep epic documentation finally. So um, before we move any further, wow everybody is pretty clear on this? Or I, I think this that call, we or? may have gotten some, uh, bear with me, I'll go ahead and and uh, let me just go ahead and uh, put that back up. So it may be that we had a few that populated from the previous okay. one, so I apologize for that. So I'll let you go ahead and, and, um, and ask the question. So this is, um, the question is, do you know what LEAP or LEP is? It looks like a good amount of our audience knows, which is good to see as well. Yeah, it may be that that, that this populated early. So, right. so well, um, in any in any event, it looks like uh, we do have a good portion of, of the, the viewing audience who is familiar with this. All right, so we will um, jump right in. So what we're talking about when we mean LEAP or LEP uh, stands for Limited English Proficient. So if you are working with a patient who has limited English or absolutely no English at all, um, that's what we mean when that, that would be a LEAP patient. And it's not just a patient, that can also mean a visitor or a family member. Uh, so if, it's, if your patient speaks English perfectly fine, but a family member or visitor comes along that is limited in English, we still would need to get an interpreter for that person as well. And the same goes for the ASL or the American Sign Language uh, needs for visitors or relatives of patients that are um, deaf or hard of hearing. So within the limited English proficient uh, population, that does include the deaf or deaf, and I put that there on purpose. Uh, basically, when you see a deaf person um, with a capital letter, or they, that's how they write it, that basically means that they are um, part of that community. They do or, um, do or use the American Sign Language, and they truly feel a part of that. Oftentimes they are um, born that way or um, born to parents that are deaf and so they're really integrated into that. Whereas um, someone who might lose hearing later on in life for whatever reason, uh, you would then see them as deaf that is not capitalized. They may or may not know American Sign Language depending on the situation, and so there is a difference there. And I like to point that out because oftentimes people might say, oh, we'll just you know, get a piece of paper and a pen and we'll write questions back and forth. Uh, and that will not be effective for someone who's deaf with a capital letter. So uh, what we'll see throughout this presentation a lot is that what really works is to get to know your patient. What works, what doesn't, right? Um, when we speak about the LEP population, it's pretty diverse. Just looking at the largest minorities in Orange County, for instance, we're looking at Carborough, Chapel Hill, and Hillsboro. In Carborough, we have the Hispanic population as being the largest minority. In Chapel Hill, which often um, stumps people as well, is that we have an 
uh, large Asian population. So we get a lot of the Mandarin um, language needs there. And then we also have a pretty large population of refugees that have been resettled in Chapel Hill. So that brings along Burmese, Karen, Rohingya, and several other languages there. And then finally, Hillsboro in um, Orange County, um, they obviously would not require a interpreter, but African American is the largest minority there. So it's just a really nice way of seeing a small part of um, really the patient population that we serve throughout North Carolina, how diverse that is in just such a small area. So looking at it a little bit closer, we have native-born LEP populations, so obviously people that were born here in the U.S. but still have language needs. And then we also have foreign-born LEP population, which are the ones that would then immigrate later on in life to the U.S. Um, and Spanish is there as the biggest um, or largest um, population of Spanish speakers there, and it really varies a lot. Um, from country to country, and even within the hospitals in our area, we saw we see lots of different um, language needs there. So for public health facts, when we are talking about the LEP population, LEAP patients are the most likely to experience adverse events of serious nature. The 75% of providers' evaluation is based on oral history as interpreted by interpreters. So just getting to know the patient and trying to find out what's going on with them, what do we need to do for them, is based on just the communication between the provider and the patient. And this is why it's so incredibly important to get that information correct. LEP patients uh, tend to have longer hospital stays. Children with LEP parents undergo more tests than typically required for the same diagnoses. Between 1990 and 2013, the LEP population in the U.S. grew 80% from nearly 14 million to 25.1 million. And finally, uh, demographic-wise, one out of five people in the U.S. today do not speak English. So that's a pretty big amount there if you, if you consider that. Oops. So another poll question, the terms interpreter and translator can be used interchangeably. 100% false. So I am talking to people that know what's going on here. Yeah. You're absolutely correct. Unfortunately, oftentimes they do get uh, used interchangeably, but it's definitely not the case. So uh, we'll go into some definitions either way. An interpreter is an individual who facilitates uh, verbal communication between two people who do not speak the same language. So it's all uh, like it's underlined there, oral communication. And here I like to point out that at UNC we're considered medical interpreters. So it's not enough to just be bilingual, nor is it enough to just be an interpreter. Uh, working in a hospital setting, we have to know all of the medical terminology, uh, be familiar with, with the procedures, anything that might come up in both of those languages if we want to be effective interpreters. So um, it's very important to be able to use a qualified interpreter who's actually um, well versed in, in all of that. So sometimes I get people come to me and say, you know what, I, I just don't, I feel uncomfortable working with interpreters because I don't ever know if they truly are understanding what I'm saying. Um, and again, here is the benefit of using a qualified interpreter. The basic purpose of the interpreter is not only to facilitate communication, but we also have to be, uh, ensure that there's understanding. Uh, with everybody in that conversation. So it's not just a matter of walking in and just word for word explaining or repeating everything we're saying. If we feel that the patient is not understanding something, we will intervene and clarify. So for example, if I have a doctor in oncology talking to a patient who's concerned because her cancer may have come back, her breast cancer, and the you know she's obviously concerned, the doctor says, oh, we got your results back and they're benign. What I'm expecting to see on that patient's face is relief, right, or um, less stress, maybe a smile. 
And if I see that that person still looks very concerned, I will definitely intervene and say, wait a minute, um, you know, do you know what benign means? Or I'll ask the doctor, can you explain what benign means so that we know for sure? And once we say, you know, that's something good, that means that there is no cancer, and I see that there's relief on that patient's face, then I've ensured understanding, and I'll move back into my um, conduit role, which I believe is on the next slide. So here are the four roles that we take on as interpreters. In the conduit role, which is the biggest part of the triangle, that's really where the interpreter wants to stay as much as possible. As I mentioned, we do clarify to make sure that there's understanding on everybody's behalf. And so again, if we feel that the patient is not understanding something, if we feel that the provider's not understanding something, or definitely if the interpreter doesn't understand something, we will intervene and clarify. So as an interpreter, for instance, if maybe the patient uses a word that the interpreter's not familiar with, we'll clarify. You know, what does that mean? Do you have, can you describe that to me? Or is there another way you can say that? so that we can also ensure that we pass along the correct information to the provider that we're working with. Uh, next on the, on the roles here is cultural broker. So oftentimes cultural beliefs can actually influence how people interpret the information that's seen to them or how they interpret the diagnoses that they get or how they deal with that, right? So sometimes we might have patients that say, it's all in the hands of God now. Uh, or, you know, I don't understand why we're, we're no longer getting any care if there's nothing else to do. Um, so cultural issues do come up. They can cause some uh, misunderstandings in the communication. And so the interpreters have to know a good bit about the culture for the people that they work with to be able to be effective. And then lastly, up on the very top of this pyramid is advocacy. So as you can see, the, the higher up we go on this, on this spectrum, the, the smaller the spaces are supposed to get because we're supposed to be there less and less time. However, if we feel that the patient's health or well-being is uh, at risk, for instance, the interpreter will step in. So if a nurse were to walk into a room and say, hey, I've got um, um, you know, your, a shot of penicillin here for you, and I know for sure that that patient's allergic to penicillin because I've worked with the patient in the past or, or whatever it might be, I will intervene and say, wait a minute, I, I believe this patient's allergic. Would you mind checking or can we check the chart? And again, we would flow right back into that conduit role, but we will intervene, say, wait a minute, let's check on this and then make sure that the, the patient remains safe. So there's also several different ways in which we can provide interpretation. In person is truly the um, preferred method for us to, to interpret. It's a lot easier if we're there in the room to be able to pick up on uh, small nuances, on nonverbal communication, on things that are happening. Um, but the reality of it also is, is that more and more clinics are going off campus, moving into the community we're growing, so we also will provide interpreter services via telephone or via video. Um, this also allows us as an organization to have access to a whole lot of different languages, right? So a lot of these, the vendors that we work with may carry as much as 150 or more languages that are available to us. So we have Spanish interpreters in-house, but languages like Burmese or Korean or the American Sign Language, we will work with our vendors in any way that we need to to get those languages there as well. Um, sometimes the telephone and video are not a good method for whatever reason, and so we still are able to work with our vendors to be able to get face-to-face -face interpreters for languages other than Spanish. Um, there are different ways in which a person can interpret. The preferred method in a hospital setting is consecutive, and that basically means that everybody is taking their turn in talking. So the provider will ask a question, the uh, patient answers, sorry, the provider asks a question, the interpreter interprets that, the patient answers, the interpreter interprets, and everybody goes back and forth. 
There are times when we have to use simultaneous interpretation, and that basically means that maybe within four to five words of someone saying something, the interpreter will begin to interpret. Simultaneous is used a lot in uh, mental health areas, so oftentimes if the patient maybe is, is um, not 100% with it and talking very quickly, uh, they have a lot going on, we're not able to interrupt, we will interpret as they're, as they're talking. This is also the case for highly emotional situations where um, the, the person just wants to be able to talk about what happened to them. We don't want to keep interrupting to be able to, to keep up with everything, so we'll go into simultaneous. So some other examples might be the uh, for a victim of domestic violence or a rape victim or someone who's just been in a traumatic car accident, they're emotional. If we feel that they need to just be able to talk without interruption, we will use the simultaneous mode. There's paraphrasing, which actually is not a um, approved method, although sometimes in certain situations it, it is needed. But basically what this means is that the interpreter will summarize what they've heard. And so you can already see by just that definition that it's not accepted per se because the interpreter won't necessarily know what we should and shouldn't interpret, right? The one thing that I think is not even important might be the one detail that the doctor wished that they did or didn't know or the provider. So um, where we might use this is maybe if we've just finished interpreting for a patient and if a spouse walks in right as we're done and with the patient's permission they say hey could you please explain what you just said to the to the to my spouse then we can just maybe give a summary if, if they're okay with that as well lastly there's site translation and this basically means that we get a uh, written document so let's say a consent form that hasn't been translated so it's in english and someone says can you please review this and let the person know what it says verbally in a different language. So uh, we don't necessarily do this here at UNC. It's, it's written in our policies that we don't have to. And the reason for, being, uh, for having this there in the policy is that it's actually pretty difficult to do. Uh, or oftentimes the documents are extremely uh, full of legal ease. They're long. Um, and it would take hours for us to do this appropriately. So we basically say if it's something that's that long and needs to um, be reviewed, we'll say, hey, can you, can you highlight the important points that you feel are necessary? And we'll verbally interpret that. Another quick example, easy one, is the uh, MRI screening form. There's several questions that are asked of the patient and so sometimes we'll have people say, oh, would you mind taking this document into room five and filling it out with the patient? Uh, we're not allowed to do that. There are, for first of all, if there's not two people that are in a room trying to talk to each other that don't speak the same language, the interpreter really shouldn't be there either. Um, we, don't, we don't like to be alone with the patient because it, puts us, it can put us in some awkward situations. Um, some confidentiality issues. So basically what we'll say is we, we can't do that, but if you want to go in, ask the questions, we can interpret that for you and we can, you know, you can fill out the form that way. Um, so these, I just wanted before I move on, the, the telephone here on the right hand of your screen is dual handset, which is really nice if you feel that maybe, uh, you know, we're, we're going into flu season and you don't want to hand that telephone back and forth, everybody gets their own handset and you're able to hear the interpreter um, in both of those so you don't have to go back and forth. It's a dual handset phone. There's, this is the corded one. There's also cordless ones. But we're seeing really more of a trend towards the video device. This is one example um, here on the left hand side. All the little rectangular white rectangles on the screen are actually different languages so you can just click on one of those and a video interpreter comes up for your assistance. If you, um, this device is actually really nice for these types of devices because um, you can roll them in, they're cordless in places like the ER or maybe labor and delivery. You know, you don't have to have a person hanging onto a phone while, while they're also trying to have a baby 
or you know going through a small procedure so it's really nice and people like to see the face of the interpreter that they're working with so we really are seeing a trend towards the use of video interpretation more than the uh, telephone although both are just as nice and then this particular device also on the very bottom you'll see a little blue um, rectangle there you can also touch that and just pick up a whole bunch of audio uh, calls or languages that may not be available in video just yet so all right so things you should know about your interpreter um, and this I always like to stress because it's so so very important um, oftentimes we might go to a meeting and someone will say oh yes I worked with a, a, a telephone interpreter several months ago and it, it just was horrible I just felt like they weren't saying what I was saying and um, you know I I didn't feel comfortable um, if we don't know who you've worked with it's really difficult for us to follow up with the vendors as well to say hey this person apparently wasn't saying what you know wasn't interpreting everything that was being said or, or we have a concern so we always have to know who you've worked with uh, I put code in there because via telephone or video oftentimes they won't give you a name but they will give you a code at the beginning or it'll be on the bottom of the video screen it's so important for you to note that in your um, notes in Epic if you go to chart so that if there is any kind of issue we always can um, identify the interpreter that you've worked with. Uh, know that the the interpreter will speak in the first person and we ask that you will that you do that as well. So instead of going into third person um, which would sound something like can you ask the patient why he came here today and if we talked in the third person we would say she wants to know why you've come here today oh he says he's been getting headaches can you ask him when his headaches got started it, as you can hear that that's really a lot of extra words a lot of extra time and so we ask that if you are working with an LEP patient that you speak to them just like you do all your English patients you know oh when did your headaches get started they started last week on a pain scale of 1 to 10 how bad do they get they get to be a 10 so that first person stays um, there as a as a rule of thumb even with your LEP patients we also like to stress that the interpreter has to repeat everything that's being said so if you say something that you really don't mean for the patient to hear please do not say that while you're with the patient or uh, step outside of the room or ask the interpreter to step out and then when you're ready to actually talk to the patient um, you can ask us to come back in but for instance uh, for example we had one one instance where we had two providers at bedside kind of discussing amongst themselves who may have almost overdosed the patient on a, on a certain medication and the interpreter started interpreting that conversation uh, and the, the providers were like no 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 we're not ready and this is not what we want to um, convey to the patient then all right let's 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 step outside for a moment or um, I'll step out and when we're ready we'll do that right and we actually tell the patients in our pre-session that that's what we want as well if there's something you don't want the provider to know please don't say it because we have to repeat everything uh, now I don't know if you'll notice but there's a little bit of some extra space on this slide because I removed one of the bullets thinking that people didn't uh, weren't doing this anymore but I've recently found out that uh, sometimes people do still like to talk louder and slower in English when dealing with an LEP patient and um, people have tried it many times over the years and it doesn't work if there's a true language barrier so if you hear yourself doing this um, please remember me and say I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and go find an interpreter uh, while dealing while working with an interpreter we still ask that you look and speak directly to your patient and not the uh, interpreter with a video it depends with a video device you obviously want to place it so that the interpreter can hear both parties but the um, the most important person there would be the patient and the patient will probably want to see the interpreter as well we ask that you talk in short units of speech so usually maybe one or two sentences at a time 
very easy for us to keep up with, to remember everything, and it goes back and forth a lot quicker and easier than uh, maybe us trying to keep up with two or three minutes worth of a conversation. Uh, most likely we will probably remember most of it, but probably have to intervene and say, wait a minute, and so I've mentioned this, this, and this, but you said something else. We have to clarify, so it, it takes longer. The next two bullets on this uh, slide, I think, make sense for your English speakers as well. So avoiding technical um, or medical terminology, abbreviations, professional jargon, uh, this can just be very confusing to the patient. So, for example, things like, when was your last BM? Or, remember, we need for you to be NPO after midnight because of your procedure in the morning. Or, uh, on the discharge instructions, sometimes we'll see, take this medication VID. That really doesn't mean anything to someone who doesn't have a medical background or, or works in the medical field, right? So, keeping it more simple, when was the last time you were able to have a bowel movement or go to the bathroom? or uh, remember, you can't eat or drink anything after midnight because of your procedure in the morning. Uh, take this medication twice a day, right? Now, especially if there is a language barrier, um, if you could try and avoid jokes, that would be great. So you're, you're, you're interpretably eternally grateful for that. Jokes oftentimes are very difficult to interpret and actually still um, keep them funny. So we ask that you can try to avoid those if possible. And slang, idiomatic expressions, metaphors, oftentimes that can get lost depending on the native language of the interpreter as well. Uh, for instance, I was shadowing an interpreter one time. Everything was going really well. We'd been in the room for a good 10 minutes, doing a great job, and all of a sudden the doctor said, okay, now we're coming into the home stretch of things. And the interpreter stood there for just a second and she said, Okay, let's talk about the stretching exercises you've been doing at home, right? And all of a sudden, the, the patient was like, oh my goodness, I haven't stretched anything. I haven't been home. And, um, you know, we had to kind of take a step back and regroup. So just try and keep these things in mind, especially when you're working with an interpreter. Uh, most recently, I was trying to interview a, someone for a position for uh, a Korean interpreter, and I said, oh, you know, here at UNC, we have every specialty under the sun. And she looked at me and she said, what, what, under what sun? You know, so I even had to catch myself and say, uh, you know, I'm sorry, we, we have every specialty that you could possibly think of. Uh, we, we provide that here at UNC. So um, even someone in the profession can make these kinds of mistakes. So um, to continue on, you still want to listen to your clients and be aware of nonverbal communication. And this is especially true if you are working with a telephone interpreter. Uh, the interpreter is not there to see what's going on, maybe pick up on things and we're not able to clarify. So now it's up to you. So for example, something that we see all the time is um, a, maybe a patient rubbing their upper arm up here and saying, my hand hurts so much. If we're there in the room, we will clarify and say, you know, you're, you're up here. Is it your whole arm or just your hand or, you know, what's, what's going on up here? And then we can get a true picture of what's happening. If we're not there, you will have to ask those kinds of questions. And oftentimes they'll use the word arm, but they really do mean, uh, I'm sorry, they'll use the word hand, but they're actually trying to refer to the whole arm. We do ask that you be patient. If you're working with an interpreter, it's just gonna take longer, right? Ideally, even if we were to just stay in conduit mode, we're still repeating all the information. So it's, it's gonna take longer and most likely, we probably will maybe clarify at some point or have to intervene for one reason or another. The next piece, again, I think makes sense for your English speakers as well, uh, but especially if you're working with an interpreter and you're concerned about the information not getting across correctly or, or you just want to make sure that it has, I would say to ask open-ended questions. Because if you don't, um, you'll get the, the famous head bob, right? You might get someone saying, did you get a chance to read the discharge instructions I left for you? Yes. Um, do you understand everything? And so you know about your follow-up appointments? And you know what signs and symptoms to look for when, when, um, before calling your doctor? And you know about your special diet? 
you know, and so on and on and on. But honestly, we really don't know if that person understands it or not. So having them give you the information back or asking open-ended questions. For instance, you know, this is the new medication we're adding to your daily regime. Tell me how you're going to take it. And that will force that patient to say, I don't remember, or they'll say, oh, yes, that's my antibiotic. I'll take it after breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the next, um, for the next 10 days, and then I'll be good. And then you know for sure that they've understood what you're saying, right? So let's go back to another poll question. If the patient agrees, is it okay to use a family member to help interpret if that family member speaks English well? All right, and, 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 and take, um, feel free to, to take uh, maybe another 10 seconds and, and think about this and then uh, go ahead and, and get your uh, vote on this poll in. Mm -hmm. And again, as always, thank you uh, all. This, this really adds to the conversation. Yeah, and yes. Our audience is so wonderful about participating in these polls. Yes. All right, so how are they doing? So they're doing pretty good. good. I'm very impressed and very happy. So um, so yes, we have 10% that said true and 90% said false. And um, let, let's talk about this a little bit. So it, it seems like it's something that we would want to do. It's easy. But um, are they a qualified interpreter would be the question, right? And most of the time that answer will be no. So, um, and sometimes we don't truly even know if they are family members, right? Uh, way back in my day, we used to, uh, we had this one lady that kept showing up in the ENT clinic and, and, you know, one day she was someone's mom and the next day she was someone's aunt and then it was a cousin and, and then it was a daughter and we're like, wow, you're, you're related to almost everybody here, right? Um, and when we looked into it a little bit further, we realized that she was actually someone that was charging the, the patients quite a bit of money to bring them to the hospital and then also to interpret for them. Um, and nobody knew what her qualifications were, right? So it's very easy for someone to say, oh, yes, I can do this. Um, but oftentimes it's, it's not as, as good as we want it to be. Uh, oftentimes family members are also not able to be impartial, right? It's a loved one. They care about them. So maybe they don't want to give them all the news. They don't want to give them all the bad negative, negative information you're giving them because it's going to make them depressed or more sad. So they'll leave certain things out or they don't really know the, the terms that you're talking about, so that just gets removed from the conversation. So um, really not a good idea. On, on many levels. So let's talk about a qualified interpreter. I sometimes I have a hard time explaining what a qualified interpreter is, so here are some other examples. If um, we have ever cooked a meal for ourselves or a family member, does that necessarily make us a chef? And the idea there would be no, right? So yes, we're both cooking or creating a meal, but the idea is that the chef is, has got all these um, ways of combining specific herbs and, and using specific temperatures and times, and the quality of his or her outcome of that meal is supposed to be at a higher level than, than what we might be able to do, right? Or looking at an NA and a nurse, a lot of the same things can be done by both of those uh, persons, but the nurse also has additional skills that they can perform that an NA probably would say, hey, I haven't learned that, that's out of my hands, right? And the same thing goes for a bilingual person versus an interpreter. So uh, a bilingual person can speak the language, but they might lack terminology. So in this case, they might lack the medical terminology. Uh, I myself have worked as a medical interpreter for 20 plus years. I cannot walk into a court system tomorrow and pretend to be a court interpreter. I am lacking the legal terminology I need. I don't know how the court system or the legal system works enough for me to be effective there. I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that I was born in Holland. I'm fluent in Dutch, but I cannot interpret in the hospital for a Dutch patient because I don't know all of the medical terminology in Dutch that, that I would need to know. Um, also, just having two languages, 
even if you have the terminology, I've met people that don't are, aren't able to toggle back and forth between the languages very easily. And when you're using it or working with an interpreter, that's really what you want, right? Is to be able to just have a natural conversation without the interpreter every time needing to pause to think about how am I going to say that or I, you know, how am I going to render that information? Uh, there's lack of training, lack of cultural insight, so lots of things can go wrong there. Knowing what to, you know, not to add information, not to omit information, not to change information around. That's all things that a qualified interpreter knows how to do appropriately uh, or not do appropriately depending on the situation. Um, over the years, we've also noted that a lot of times people say, oh yeah, I can do this, I'm, I'm qualified. Um, it's happened so much so that now Joint Commission, the Office of Civil Rights, um, several other er things that we'll see in just a moment require proof of competency. So it's not enough to just say, yes, I'm bilingual, I, I don't need an interpreter. As a hospital, we need to be able to show that someone's been tested and passed a, a specific assessment to be able to say, yes, you are qualified and you no longer need to call an interpreter. Um, so sometimes we think it's okay to use children to help interpret for the parents and um, I have another small little video that I wanted to share with everybody uh, that I think is pretty powerful in regards to children being used as, as interpreters. So I um, love this video just because she happens to uh, bring up every point that, that I tend to talk about as well when we talk about uh, children being used in the medical setting. So, um, let's see, so the use of children, like she mentioned, same thing with government officials versus the, the providers here, right? People don't, the children don't always understand what's being said medically. We've seen in the past uh, kids confusing chewing gum with gums in the dental clinic, your, your gums, or confusing television for TB. Have you ever been exposed to TB? And getting an answer of, well, yes, you know, every afternoon I spend a good three or four hours watching. Uh, you know, that's obviously not what that was meant there. Um, and like she mentioned as well, sometimes the kid's English is great, but that secondary language that the parents speak at home, it's not something that they want to even um, use oftentimes or learn or, or keep up with. So even though their English is great, maybe that other language is not as... as um, proficient as you need for it to be. It can be very traumatic. Um, you know, obviously if the child is here, they're either related to the patient or close to them, and they they can be petrified of, of you know, what am I supposed to say? I don't understand what's going on, and they just do their best because they don't think it's okay to say, I don't, I don't know how to do this, right? Um, and a lot of times over the years, I, I talked about this, and it never really hit me until I, um, heard another person saying when she was 12, she and her whole family ended up having to go to the ER because her grandfather got really ill um, and they did not have a Portuguese interpreter at the hospital. And when the, the providers came back, she went ahead and interpreted for her grandmother and the rest of the, the family members. And she said that the moment she told her grandmother that her grandfather had cancer, and that he was going to have to come into the hospital for further evaluation, etc. She said, I lost my grandmother in that moment. She never again was able to see me or look at me in the same way because I was the one who gave her that, that news. And then shortly after that, um, she lost her grandfather to the cancer as well. So pretty traumatic and unnecessary to do to a child that, that young, right? Uh, and they can be worried about getting in trouble. Or sometimes um, it's uncomfortable and you may not get the correct information. Let's talk about um, a visit in gynecology. Do you want to use a 12 or 14 year old to ask how many sexual partners have you had? Are you sexually active? Uh, either you're going to get incorrect information because the mom doesn't want to necessarily openly talk about these things in front of her um, child or you're just going to make both of them very uncomfortable, right? Because it's not something that maybe you want to hear about your mom or try to interpret for that. So uh, please keep that in mind when trying to use children. 
Uh, not too long ago, we had a situation where the, the nurse was trying to be nice and telling the interpreter, you know what, you don't have to stay because the child can interpret everything for his grandparents. He's, his English is great. Uh, I don't think the child was, I think he was between 12 and 14 years old. Um, and so I liken that to a situation where maybe an English speaker would drop off their child in a specialty clinic and say, hey, you know, go, go see the doctor, and in the meantime, I'm going to run to the supermarket and get, our, get, get some things that I need, and when I get back, just, just let me know what happened, right? Most people, when I ask them, would you ever do that, are aghast. They say, of course I would never do that. So if you think about it, why would you ask that of a person who's not able to speak English, right? Um, those grandparents or the parents or the legal guardians are still responsible for those children. So they have to be able to know what's happening, be able to ask questions uh, and, and know, what's, know what to do and what not to do. So very important there. Uh, again, when not using a qualified interpreter, you don't know what is being said and not being said, right? So off, even in situations where sometimes they say, oh, but the, the workman's comp person came in with an interpreter. Um, we still don't know what the qualifications of that interpreter is. So unless they've been vetted as a, as a qualified vendor by UNC, it is still not okay to even use outside interpreters. Or sometimes the interpreter might be great, but then they turn around and say, well, here's my bill, and we don't even have a contract in place for them. So um, for many reasons, we have to make sure that they're qualified and also approved by, by our organization. Um, if we don't use a qualified interpreter, we can get into compliance reviews, federal investigations, loss, loss of federal funds, or even joint commission accreditation. So lots of lots of important things here on the line right and this is all based on title six it uh, says that no person in the United States and it doesn't say whether they're here legally or illegally or what their immigration status is it just means they're here in the US um, on the grounds of race color or national origin uh, will be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So here at UNC, because we do receive uh, federal funds like Medicaid, Medicare, maybe grants, by law based on Title VI, we have to provide interpreter services to anybody who needs it or asks for it uh, free of charge. So sometimes I've had a doctor say, but he doesn't really need an interpreter. I don't know why he's asking for one. If they request an interpreter, we need to provide that for them. Um, and then further on in the slide, there's several other different policies that all fall under the reasons why we want to provide an interpreter. And of course, this is all legal framework, but even just in the the reality of it, it's nice for you to be able to communicate openly and um, effectively with your patients, right? So even if the law weren't in place, we would still have interpreter services available just because less testing, you know what's going on, and it's just easier for everybody involved. Um, so it, when talking about Title VI, if we do not provide interpreter services, they basically say that's discrimination, um, it's language-based, and that falls under the national origin discrimination of Title VI. And um, to date, Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act is still in place, and that basically just advances everything that was set in place by Title VI. Uh, in addition, DHHS, again, um, helps us with compliance rules and regulations that we need to follow. Uh, again, it, it regulates who can interpret, right? So we need to make sure that they're qualified. Being bilingual in itself is not, uh, does not meet that requirement. We have to be able to demonstrate that we know that they're qualified, have that specialized terminology, make sure that we have confidentiality in place. So a lot goes into that. Uh, so here is another poll question. By law, we must provide our LEP patients and visitors a qualified medical interpreter free of charge. 
Uh, did you know this excludes family members, friends, and interpreters that accompany patients or staff that have not been cleared to interpret by UNC? So the answers here, I, I did know that. I did not know that before this presentation, or I did know, but sometimes I don't have time to wait for an interpreter, or I don't know how to request one, or I did know and um, always do my best to use the interpreter services provided by UNC, right? So um, I'm almost kind of glad that we have a good percentage of people that didn't know this before the presentation because now you know. So hopefully that will help you uh, make that determination when saying, oh, but the family member is right here and they're effective. Uh, we, we can get in big trouble for that. So please make sure that you know how to find us. Some misunderstandings, um, so sometimes people say, oh, but I understand a good bit of, uh, I understand a good bit, or what if they understand most of what I'm saying? So most of what you're saying is not enough, right? Because again, what if they miss the most important piece and they understand the rest of it? So for instance, here on this slide, I could say something like, no lo siento, or if I say, no lo siento, I'm using the same three words, but by um, putting in that pause in the second phrase, I'm changing the complete meaning. So if I say, no lo siento, I mean, I don't feel it. Or if I say, no lo siento, I'm saying, no, I'm sorry. Um, and this also apparently is very similar in ASL. Sometimes the, the sign remains the same, but if the person leans to the right versus the left or um, small little details like that, the meaning of that sign changes. So um, a good example, an unfortunate, although good example of this is uh, Willy Ramirez was 18 years old when he um, was brought to a hospital in Florida. And he, uh, you know, the word intoxicado got thrown around uh, between providers and family members. Uh, but in English, the providers assumed they meant, oh, he's, he's intoxicated or, he, or he's had a drug overdose. Uh, his girlfriend had mentioned that they had had an argument earlier in the day, so they thought maybe he had tried to take his life. Um, but really what, the, what he was trying or what the family was trying to say is that I, I believe he's uh, been poisoned or ingest, ingested something that's made him sick because he'd gone out to a fast food restaurant earlier in the day. What really was happening with Willie is that he was having a um, massive head bleed and because he didn't get the treatment that he needed as quickly as he did, he ended up a quadriplegic. So the hospital did end up paying out a $71 million payout to him, which seems like a lot of money, but you also have an 18-year-old child who is now quadriplegic for life. So um, there's really no, no winning in this situation, right? Um, so be mindful of false cognates or words that can mean two different things. So again, intoxicado doesn't necessarily mean, it doesn't mean intoxicated. Uh, embarazada doesn't mean that you're embarrassed, it means pregnant. Uh, sensible or sensible means reasonable in English, but sensitive in French or Spanish. And um, angine can mean angina pectoris, or it can also mean a sore throat. So um, if you maybe say, oh, I, I think I understood or I understand pretty well, uh, we can run into some issues again. Uh, legally, again, telling people, oh, it's past five o'clock, all our interpreters are gone. Remember that telephone and video um, service that we have? Staff muddling through it and patients not really understanding. The use of a child, HIPAA violations because maybe a uh, visitor got asked to come and help out of the waiting area or another patient was asked to come help. Family members used. Uh, offensive terminology because people didn't understand it all correctly or no interpreter was provided at all. Um, reading lips is only 30 to 45 percent accurate and um, on the basis of time I'm going to skip this this uh, video but if you want to go back and look at it it's pretty it's pretty interesting. Again writing back and forth may not be effective if, if that person never learned how to read or write right if they went straight into American Sign Language. 
Uh, and sometimes people don't want a video interpreter, and we have to do our best to try and, and um, get the, what the patient wants. Although, if need be, we are allowed to use video interpreters. So, another poll question. If the patient or family members insist that they don't want an interpreter, are you still allowed to request one? And so, um, absolutely, this is the case. If you're not comfortable or you still want to make sure that the conversation is, is going as it should be, you are allowed to request us and we will allow the family member to interpret, but we will also intervene if something's missed or um, not being interpreted correctly. So absolutely, you have every right to get an interpreter for yourself. Um, quickly, translation is all written work. So that's the difference there. Interpreters verbal, translation is all written stuff. A lot of the same regulations hold true for the uh, written information. The things to consider here is that if 5% of your, or 1,000 persons of your overall patient population speak a specific language, then vital documents need to be translated into that language. So uh, language assistance, free of charge needs to do that, consent forms, discharge instructions, um, as you see on the list here. Uh, things to determine whether things should get translated, the number of um, your patient population, how often is that document going to be, get used, how, um, what's the nature and importance of that document, and what are your resources available, right? Although oftentimes the courts won't really necessarily care too much about your resources versus what your legal um, policies are there. Translation services can be difficult, and again, you should use a qualified translator just as much as you need a qualified interpreter. So making sure you go to specific vendors that you can trust. Um, ATA is the American Translator Association that you can go to to see, uh, look up for qualified uh, in translators there. It can be pretty expensive, but if you find translators that want to do things for really cheap, you probably will want to look into their qualifications as well. So um, in the case of an emergency, is it okay for me to use Google Translate to help communicate with my patients? Absolutely false. Mm -hmm. Correct. So um, this does, is not accurate in the least. It's about 58% accurate in Spanish. Um, and it goes downhill, and sometimes I even have people say, is 58% not better than nothing at all? And no, it's not. Um, if you want to have a quick laugh, you can Google Jimmy Fallon and look up some of these videos uh, on Google Translate. Uh, they're, pretty, they're pretty funny. Um, some of the Google results, and I'll kind of go through these on, on our basis of time, but as you can see, um, easily get confused with things, right? The two things I want to point out on this one is your mom needing to be aired. Sounds lovely, right? It's nice and cool out. No, she actually needs to be ventilated. So a whole different story there, right? Or a six-year-old who almost left the hospital with written instructions on um, needing to return to erectile dysfunction clinic if things continue to worsen. Uh, what, they, what, what the AVS said was emergency department and Google Translate turned that into erectile dysfunction, which I actually saw on a second patient not too long ago as well. So, um, so here is my email. If you want to um, send me your questions via, via email because you don't have time or whatever it might be or you have additional things you want to discuss, feel free to contact me. Uh, you know, here's some issues highlighted, no family members, children, or friends to interpret. And there's another funny little video here at the end if you want to pull that up on your own time. Just be prepared. Get to know your patients and know what their needs are. All right. Thank you so much. That's just a tremendous wealth of information. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, we've gone over time just a little bit. So I, I do want to say a, a few quick thank yous, and then we'll take just a minute or two for any questions you may have. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all the hard work they do for this and every one of our lectures. Also the uh, North Carolina General Assembly for their generous support of the University Cancer Research.
Research Fund and the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, here's a place where you can go ahead and share your questions, and I'll, I'll have one to, to be brief while we wait for any others that may that, that may arrive. Um, thoughts about oncology specifically, and are there are there situations unique to to oncology that that our listeners might think about? Uh, related to to, to the uh, limited English proficiency population, right? So we um, oncology is is full of specialized terminology. Mm -hmm. It's a very stressful situation, mm -hmm. um, and especially there when it comes to the use of family members. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen over the years family members saying, "Oh, we don't want to tell mom she's got cancer because mm -hmm. it's going to just make her too upset," or we mm -hmm. don't want to give her all the details. Mm -hmm. And so we're taking away the autonomy of that patient. Right. right. Um, I've met patients who said, I don't I don't want chemo. I, mm -hmm. I'm a, I've had a great life. Mm -hmm. I want to go back home and see my family one last time. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, in that particular case, having a qualified interpreter who's not uh, who can be impartial mm -hmm. and pass along all the information as needed. Right. Extremely valuable. Right. All yeah. right. Thank you. We, we should go ahead and, and close. So uh, I have a whole list of questions. I, I have uh, the good fortune of maybe being able to ask Miriam a few more of those after, after we finish up here. But she did generously provide her email address. Yes. So uh, for anyone who would like to follow up with her, please do. Also, all of the links to all of those videos, including the ones we didn't have time for today, are on the recording. And so you'll be able to see those links there. Uh, we have, uh, as always, lectures coming up. Clinical Trial Update in Head and Neck Cancer with Dr. Chera, and that's on October 23rd at noon. And then Tobacco Use Treatment and Cancer Care uh, with um, Ellen uh, Rubush and Colleen Meyer, that's on November 13th at 12 uh, noon as well. So we hope that you'll be available uh, for both of those and many more lectures coming up. We have uh, more self-paced lectures going on to our portal every month, including Best of ASCO 2019 and Professional Development and Continuing Education for Oncology Nurses. Cancer Conversations, the next in the series is Living with Breast Cancer, October 25th with uh, Dr. Gallagher. And with that, thank you so much for being here today. And at every one of our lectures, please spread the word. And uh, we'll see you next time.